So, how do you know something's epic fantasy? Well, it's at least a trilogy, and The King's Throne is made from something weird. And Tad Williams has it all. Cheers. Welcome back, everybody, to me talking about fantasy books, and today we will be talking about that Dragonbone Chair, which is book one of the Memory Sorrow Thorn trilogy, which comes in four books, which is a pattern for Tad Williams. This is the first series of the larger Austin Ard um, cycle of Tad Williams, and um, I've read it before, but I figured what with the final volume, The Navigator's Children, coming out right now, um, it would be a good idea to go back, look at uh, the first trilogy, and then read the new stuff, and see how things have changed, how the old books have held up, and how the new books are, because it doesn't happen that often that an author goes back to a 30-year-old uh, series and writes again in that world. Except, you know, for George R. R. Martin, who's definitely on track for that. And it would be interesting to see how maybe things that haven't aged well, um, in my opinion, got changed by um, Ted Williams in the new series. So this is what we're going to do. This will be about the Dragonbone Chair. We'll be talking about Stone of Farewell next, and then Two Green Angel Tower, probably both books in one go. We will see how I feel about that, but it's probably going to um, keep us busy for the next couple of weeks because these are big books. And we'll usually uh, do the usual thing, which is I'll give a quick synopsis, tell you why you really should go and read them, and uh, then we'll talk about themes and stuff and so forth where I may drop a spoiler or two. Once again, these are 35-year-old books um, in part. Um, I feel most of it is not a huge spoiler anymore, but be forewarned, I'll let you know when we enter spoiler-ish territory. Alright, so what's the Dragonbone Chair and why should you read it? The Dragonbone Chair, as I said, is the first part of the Memory Sorrow Thorn trilogy, which came in four books, and it's probably one of the most popular epic fantasy books from that weird epic fantasy wasteland between <laughs> Lord of the Rings and Wheel of Time. And by wasteland, I mean uh, just, you know, the, the era. Not that there weren't, like, great books published, but yeah, that's sort of what we what I'm talking about. It is, um, has been highly praised by other authors. First and foremost, George R. R. Martin, who uh, called it his favorite fantasy series again and again. Um, and you can certainly see influences of Ted Williams' work in Westeros and other fantasy. It does sort of um, fall in that weird spot between a very Tolkien fantasy and a more modern fantasy. It's, in that regard, a bit of a bridge, and we'll certainly explore why that is in uh, this video. It does, however, have a lot of the things, a lot of the stuff we come to expect from epic fantasy. It has a kitchen boy going on an adventure. Suddenly the entire world is in danger, and we trudge through large forests and so forth, having the usual kind of adventures in a pseudo-medieval um, world that is a secondary world, um, so not our world. And there's maybe magic, maybe not, and um, other stuff, strange species like trolls and... Um, Elves, although they're called Sithy in this one, and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's a bit more gritty than Lord of the Rings. It is um, far more unique and well-written than either The Sword of Shannara by Terry Brooks or Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan, which got published only a few years afterwards. And it's, it's a slow read, but it's definitely one that I would say is well worth if you want to know how we got where we are with epic fantasy today. Or if you really enjoy Tolkien and want to read more that feels similar, even though it is um, unique enough to stand on its own. It's a perfect autumn book. I love reading it in autumn. It kind of feels, um, you know, appropriate to the mood because it's constantly raining, <laughs> winter is coming, and they're trudging through the forest, which is, you know, the perfect autumn activity. So if all of these things feel like you like, they might be for you, and if you don't fear books that have over a thousand pages, go get yourself the Dragonbone Chair and get yourself, you know, at least the next two, three books as well, which are, you know, Storm of Farewell and Two Green Angel Tower, part one and two, and then decide whether you want to move on with the rest. <laughs> 
Um, there are no trigger warnings beyond, well, it's a big boy, you need time. And uh, that being said, let's talk about um, what it does, why it does the things it does, what problems there are, because it is obviously a book written in the 80s, and um, then uh, maybe um, move on to some grander pronouncements. Uh, we will see. I mean, I'll have a bit of beer and then we'll talk about spoilers. All right, let's talk about what this book does, or the entire series does, and um, where we need to look at is history. See, if you've looked into the history of fantasy literature a bit, you kind of know that Lord of the Rings was not a an immediate success worldwide. It came out in the 1950s, but it took until the 1960s for it to become big in the US, which is, well, <laughs> the largest market for this kind of stuff at the time. And... It got there through piracy first, which, uh, you know, the story has been told before, even by me. Ace Books found a loophole in copyright law which allowed them to uh, publish a paperback version of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which became a huge deal. Ballantine Books uh, had to um, get a slightly changed, revised version of the manuscript by talking to publish their own and thus make the other one illegal and so forth. It's, it's a whole thing, but it established um, Lord of the Rings as a success. It obviously coincided with, you know, the rise of the 68, 1968 um, hippie movements and all of these um, political movements at the time that did kind of see something in Tolkien's love for nature that made these books even more successful. But what it happened, what it did was it established Ballantine and allowed Ballantine books to establish their adult fantasy series. Um, First of all, they started reprinting uh, classics from the 1920s that were probably really cheap to get, like Hope Murley's Letter in the Mist and uh, David Lindsay's A Voyage to Arcturus. I think that one was in there. E.R. Eddings' um, The Worm Ouroboros and a bunch of other classics. And then they started to look for other authors that, you know, could provide more stuff like Lord of the Rings because Lord of the Rings sold so well. Um, which brought us, among other things, <laughs> the wonderful bit and that is The Sword of Shannara. I will not talk about it today. I think it's unfair to rip on it. It's very easy to dunk on Sword of Shannara and Terry Brooks has moved on from there to create his own very unique style of fantasy and I feel bad for mocking that early book where he had to write something that just didn't work that well. After that, obviously, people still wrestled with Tolkien. Um, we got um, Stephen R. Donaldson's um, deconstruction of Tolkien with the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant. And then, finally, near the 80, end of the 80s, we got the Dragonbone Chair. Because one thing that writers and publishers still tr struggled with was to, cre to recreate the success of Tolkien. And... The problem is you can't recreate success by recreating the book. You can't do the same thing and hope it'll be successful. Which is why we have a shit ton of werewolf novels and vampire novels, but none of them are as successful as Twilight. We have a shit ton of teen dystopias, and none of them are as successful as The Hunger Games. Same goes for Lord of the Rings copies. We do have the Sword of Shannara, but it's, well, it's just the Sword of Shannara, and we do have a lot of other similar books from the times that are all not as successful. I think, and I believe I can show, that the Dragonbone Chair and Memory Sorrow Thorn did change that by finding a way to take the things that people loved about Tolkien and Tolkien's work and adding something new or old to it that made it accessible to at least a large enough um, part of the reading public to uh, do its own thing that is similar enough so people like it, but unique enough so people can still like it and don't have to go like, well, why don't I just read the original? That's what we'll talk about mostly today. And for that, we'll look at two things, two strands mostly. One of them is the dreaded word world building or talking about the setting because Middle Earth as one of the most well, one of the earliest secondary world fantasies and Tolkien has obviously talked about world building a lot that's certainly part of what made Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings so powerful and so successful the other part that we need to talk about is how <clears throat> you know Tolkien and then mostly Ted Williams after him handled prose handled characters handled action and you know the the actual writing of a story. <laughs> um, because I think there's where you can find changes that make, you know, the Dragonbone Chair what it is. But let's start with, well, the world building. 
See, Middle Earth is a very complex world. And partly that is because, you know, because of Tolkien's skills. Tolkien, as an academic, spent like decades building that world, has experience, had experience in, you know, mythology, uh, philology, and so forth, that allowed him to do something very unique because most people don't have those qualifications, which is totally fine. What happens then is people try to copy the idea of world building in that regard, um, but usually just pick the surface level, the stuff we see on the top, you know, when we read Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. <laughs> but that means you just talk about like how stuff looks and how people talk, um, but you leave out the thing that gives it depth. <laughs> Stephen Erickson has talked about like deep world building and stuff like that before. I don't want to go there right now, but it, you know, as I said, it, it's a very involved process, and most people don't have the qualifications um, and time to do that. So it's more about collecting bits and pieces that look similar enough and just dragging them together. And one approach for that is, of course, to look at our world. People have done that before. Robert E. Howard did it with the Hyborian Age for his Conan stories when he wanted to write historical fiction without having to deal with his three nerds telling him that he got it wrong. And basically just dropped a bunch of um, our world's countries, um, kingdoms, countries from different time periods on like a map, called it the Hyborian Age, and gave it some similar names so everyone knows what he's talking about when someone is in Aquilonia versus Stygia versus Shem versus um, Kush and so forth. Um, but, um, you know, it's fantasy. And when you look at the world building of Austin Art, this world, you can see how Chad Williams is kind of taking stuff from both of these approaches. Clearly, the world feeling he's going for is much more a Middle-earth style. It has to be feel, you know, grand. There is the idea that this world has been around forever, and there's, you know, the Sithi as um, sort of elves that um, have been around for thousands of years, so there is that depth of time that is important for Middle-earth. But there's also, the cultures are very much collected from our world in a lot of ways. With, you know, serial numbers filed off in part, but only in part. And that leads to some issues. But maybe these are actually more features than bugs. So, for example, we have King John, who's called Prester John, or John Presbyter. Now, if you've known anything about medieval history, or maybe have read Baudolino by Umberto Eco, you know that we have a Prester John, or at least the legend of a Prester John, in our medieval history. I'm sure he crops up with Otto von Freising and so forth, and he's supposedly a priest and a king of a Christian kingdom somewhere in the mysterious East. Now, obviously, <laughs> there's a bunch of assumptions in here. Now, calling your king Prester John or Priest King means that he should probably be a priest because that's kind of what the title says. John is not a priest in um, Austin Ard. So there's that because obviously the Catholic Church doesn't exist. We have a church equivalent, which is the uh, Syrian or Adonite uh, Church, which is very much the Catholic Church without ever, you know, talking about full-on like dogma or anything of the sorts. We just take the surface. We just take the, the image. We take the spectacle without um, the substance is the point here. And that's something we see again. We have Weird bits like the legend of the noble knight who was turned into a kitchen boy who was called Beautiful Hands, which is a direct reference to Sir Gareth of Orkney or Sir Beaumain, which means Beautiful Hands, which um, is part of the Arthurian cycle. And, well, a knight who was pushed into the kitchen and someone, in this case Sir Kay, gave him that name to mock him in this... In... So he takes these bits and pieces and puts them in. He puts in the Rimmer Scarders, who used to believe in a god or worship a god called Udin. Now, if that sounds Viking to you, that's because it is. Or you take the Hernesteri, who are sort of generic Celts and are named after their first king, Hern the Hunter, which, yeah, that's a bit blunt. And, and that's sort of the problem that you have if you just uh, pick and choose magpie-like from our world's history and throw everything together in one world and um, create and try to keep sort of consistency or an overarching atmosphere or theme going. It's a similar thing if you go and look at 1980s um, fantasy settings for, say, Dungeons and Dragons, if you look at the Forgotten Realms, for example, which have the, the same approach. The problem is, they feel magical and fantastical if this is the first fantasy you're reading, if this is um, the first or the second fantasy you're reading. Once you've read a bit more, or maybe have, you know, studied history or read history books or whatever, you see where the stuff comes from, 
and you see where the writer takes shortcuts. So this is this is very much of the issue that I personally have with Austin Art, where it becomes difficult for me to read this with a straight face, is when I see these bits and pieces crop, I'm like, I know where you took this, and I know how it could have been done better, because, yeah, you know, this is the year 2023, 20, and I've been around for a while. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly no Tolkien, but this is also not my first rodeo, is my point. Um, which... I, once again, I think this may be a feature and not a bug. For me, it's a bug, but that's a special case. <laughs> there are obviously darker aspects to this. Which is when we talk about the trolls. We also need to talk about the Sithi, but I'll keep that part mostly for the next discussion, when we actually see more of their culture than we see in this book. But we do meet the trolls for the first time. We'll come back to them when Stone of Farewell is up as well. But we meet, we meet Binabik, the troll, who is basically a halfling a Native American, sort of. And, and, and that's exactly the problem. So they are a non-human species, um, and they do need a culture. And for reasons, um, Tad Williams picked very much a Native American, mostly north, very far north, with, you know, some Inuit and so forth overtones in there as the culture to model or appropriate for the trolls. And that's a problem in some areas, because obviously um, it gets flattened into a lot of stereotypes with shamans and singing and, um, and so forth. Um, it also, he also gives those um, characters a lot of, like, weird sayings, which are tied to that, like, mystical aspect of um, a lot of, you know, stereotypes um, people have about Native Americans. It also shows up in the language, because Binabik obviously speaks in a weird accent, which is bad and really racist in parts. And it kind of shows that when you take cultures that are not your own, unlike, say, you know, the Celtic bits and the medieval bits and the Viking bits and so forth, if you take another culture, possibly a from a colonized or marginalized culture, it's very difficult to do that correctly or do them, you know, do that in a more sensible or sens sensitive way, you know, without, you know, hurting people. Obviously, this is something, um, you know, this was written in the 1980s when racism had been defeated by the civil rights movement and everyone was on cocaine and dealing with other things. So it's, very much where I would say it's not deliberate racism, it's just something that people didn't think about. I mean, we're still arguing about, about cultural appropriation today because some people are slow to get the message. But this will be something I'm looking forward to finding out in the follow-up books from now, because you can't write troll culture like this in 2020 without getting problems. And I hope, or I'm, I'll, it'll be interesting to see if Tad Williams kind of adapted in that regard. So that's the darker side of picking and choosing if you don't have enough background or have enough um, sensitivity to these topics. So compared to Middle-earth, this is very much a surface-level world, which is usually fine because at the end of the day, you're telling a story, you're not creating a world. Um, with some dark aspects, but also it kind of makes it very easy to get into that world because... Yeah, Rimmer's, man, Rimmer's Goddards are cartoon Vikings. We've all seen cartoon Vikings. It makes it easy to connect to that world, and I think that's something we'll see again. So let's look at, you know, the, the other bits and pieces when we compare that to an older style of fantasy. Let's look at the prose. Now, I think something interesting happens here, because when people talk about um, the Dragonbone Chair, or generally uh, these books, they talk about how this, the prose is slow and Tolkien-like, and how it's, um, you know, a lot of things. And yes, these are thick books, and they are rich in detail. Tad Williams loves to describe t details. He's more into, like, interior design than he is into nature, like Tolkien, but he does do a lot of that, and yet his prose is different from Tolkien's. Tolkien has a very lyrical, um, poetic style, which makes sense when you think about how he's influenced by epic poetry, like Beowulf, and so forth. That leads to a specific rhythm and uh, choice of words. Ted Williams doesn't do that. Ted Williams does also not write, um, you know, pulp fiction in the vein of Robert E. Howard or Fritz Leiber. He does, in fact, <clears throat> tread a, a middle path there. You get a more workmanlike language, the, um, 
choice of words is a bit more modern than it is with Tolkien. But you still get like elaborate descriptions of places that means that he does take a lot of time to get to a point. Ted Williams is still very much like walking through a forest on like a winding path um, and admiring uh, the environment. It's a it's not the primordial forest of a Tolkien story. It's more a kept lawn of a 19th century forest at this point. But you can still get all of these things. You're still not on the highway, is my point, when it comes to the prose. And once again, this makes it more accessible. A lot of people have trouble with reading Tolkien because his language feels archaic. Um, Tad Williams' language doesn't feel archaic. It feels slightly old-timey from time to time. And it certainly flows very slowly. But it's more accessible in that regard, and I think that's part of what makes this work um, the way it does, or made it work the way it did back in the 1980s. Probably, nowadays, things are different as, again. Then, let's look at the characters, which I think is where um, most of the strength lies here. Because, if you read Tolkien, for example, it's an empty world. There's very few characters in there, and these characters are usually heroes. Which makes sense if, you know, epic poetry and heroic poetry is your model. You just talk about the heroes. You don't hear about the kitchen boy that make sure, made sure that Agamemnon and Achilles got fed outside of Troy. You never hear about those poor fuckers. Here, you do. At least in part. There are servants. There's the entire domestic staff of the hayhold of the castle. Our hero, Simon um, Mooncalf, is in fact a kitchen boy. There's chandlers. There's this craftsmen and their apprentices. Where we talk to soldiers, there are just regular soldiers and spearmen talking about how they're sending half of their pay home to their family and so forth. And I think this is an important step that even with uh, something like um, both uh, the Sword of Shannara or the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, you don't really get. Here, the world feels more lived in because it is, you know, he takes... You know, time to talk about the common people, the regular folks, making this world feel more lived in. Which, once again, makes sense if you think about this being an American novel. Um, American novels have often looked at the everyman in a way that a lot of British literature or other literature has not up to fairly recently. And you can see the everyman kind of sliding in here into this world, and I think that's a strength of the Dragonbone Chair and the books that come after. And... Yeah. The other part is, there are female characters. <laughs> female characters are not necessarily a strong suit of older epic fantasy, of, of older fantasy in general, uh, unfortunately. There's obviously um, one or two female characters in Lord of the Rings that actually get, like, spoken lines, but they're very few. And um, here there are a few more. There is um, the Wise Woman of the Forest, there is, of course, Princess Miriamel, there is um, Borsheba, which is uh, Prince Joshua's wife, uh, or not wife, but lover, or whatever, and there's more. So uh, there's Rachel the Dragon, and, and we need to be clear here. It's great that there are female characters that do actually have a bit of personality. There is unfortunately a downside to this, which is that the female characters are still very stereotypical. There's a level of casual sexism in this. We'll come back to that when we talk about um, those characters in later books. I'm sure we'll resume it, but for now, the female characters are mostly very emotional and not very calculating. It's one of those, you know, classic stereotypes where women are emotional, and men are rational, and so forth. It's, it's particularly clear in the Borseba versus um, Prince Joshua um, uh, combination. We also have um, Princess Miriamel, who really wants to do something, which is a bit of like an AON situation. Um, we'll see how that goes once again in later books. Just wanted to make clear that, yes, there are female characters, which is a step forward, but these are... <laughs> very stereotypical in a lot of ways, and that can lead to problems down the road. Action is another point. See, say, Lord of the Rings, an epic fantasy of that sort, is not necessarily very action-heavy. Yes, there are battles, there is fighting, but most of it is very, is highly stylized and abstract. You don't see a lot of blood spurting um, or, you know, <laughs> guts falling on the ground. People are not doing the things that happen in, you know, say, grimdark fantasy. And once again, we see the Dragonbone Chair slowly moving towards that direction, because the battles are more bloody. There's more 
explicit description of combat, people riding against each other on horses, ducking blows by swords, sticking their swords somewhere, blood is actually spurting. Battle is more graphic in this one. I think that makes it more accessible. Once again, this is a general trend. The media had moved towards a more graphic, more gritty depiction of violence from the 1970s onwards. At least mainstream media did so from the 70s onwards. onwards. And it kind of shows up here. It's still very mellow compared to, um, you know, your Joe Abercrombie novels, but it, it slowly happens. And that, that kind of action is more gripping and keeps you to the page. It's what, you know, people loved about, say, Conan the Barbarian stories, which are very action-packed and full of adrenaline, and some of that has slowly swapped over into the battles here. Another part there that I really liked about the first book is when they're climbing up the mountain to get the, the sword near the end, because that's a very gripping description of mountaineering with people, you know, using tools, ice axes, being roped to each other, someone falling into a crevasse and being pulled back out. It's, it's gripping action writing for a non-combat scene, and it really did remind me of um, the story Stardock by Fritz Lieber, which is where Fafford and the Grey Mouser climb a mountain for most of the story is just them climbing up a mountain, which is really cool. Um, and that brings me to the fact that I think Fritz Lieber was an influence on Tad Williams. I don't know if he's ever acknowledged it in some way, but having Prince Joshua use a very yeah, well, basically a rapier-style sword and calling it Nadal, which is very close to Needle, um, Kind of reminds me of uh, the mouse's uh, rapier, which is called scalpel, and you know was um, then <laughs> called lancet or got like in um, in Gentleman of the Road by Michael Shabon, the uh, ma mouse-like character has a sword called lancet to uh, to keep that joke going, and I think it does pay homage. For me, it, it felt like it was paying homage to that to that aspect in there. So. That kind of brings me to the end of these meanderings here. What Ted Williams does with the Dragonbone Chair, and which makes it a unique story, is taking the feelings of the Lord of the Rings, of that form of epic fantasy, but marrying it or using skills that are more from the American tradition, the pulp traditions and American literary traditions, the ones that um, Michael Moorcock pointed out in Epic Pooh when he said that it's um, more modern, more energy-packed, more forward-looking than uh, Tolkien's epic fantasy. These traditions of having action-packed prose, having every main ca man characters, having all these bits and pieces, he uses them to tell a story that feels Tolkien-like, but is accessible to everyone who's, you know, more, also to everyone who's more on that side, who wants a story about people like us, that do people, stuff like us. Someone who doesn't want to go and look up every second word because the language is just so archaic. Someone who doesn't want to read pages and pages and pages of history before he understands a culture, because he's like, well, these seem to be cartoon Vikings, basically. And, and that makes the book different enough from uh, Lord of the Rings. So it reaches a new audience, while it still feels comfortably close enough to all the things that made Lord of the Rings su such a success. And that's why I think that the Dragonbone Chair is that necessary step from a Tolkien-heavy fantasy, epic fantasy of the 1950s towards the fantasy of the 1990s and 2000s, while it, because it does marry these different traditions of fantasy and turns them into something that is still close enough to the big boy while using parts of the language of, you know, the more popular uh, pulp fictions and traditions as well. Which is quite the achievement, and I'm uh, glad that it happened this way, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. If so, let me know down in the comments what you think about the Dragonbone Chair, what you like about it, um, what you don't like about it, um, if you think it has aged poorly or if it has aged well, um, if you plan to read it, and so forth. Put it down in the comments. I'd love to hear all about it. Um, I'll be back talking about Stone of Farewell, where we move forward, look at some more details, possibly plot-related, mostly more theme-related sometime next week. Until then, I wish you all a great weekend. Um, do something fun. I'll talk to you very soon, and until then, thanks and cheers.